to look at some apps for adult literacy teaching and learning and you can see on the first um, slide here there's a big pile of apps and we're going to talk about a big pile of apps. I'm going to do my very best not to sprint through this webinar but I may do some sprinting at the end. I'm going to talk about a lot of apps but you don't need to make note of them. We have created a public Evernote page. You just click on the link and it takes you right there where you can um, see all of the apps um, the information, the documents that we that we talk about today. So, um, I'll just, um, this is who I am. Some of you just saw me on my webcam, and you will see that this picture is somewhat out of date. I'm so much better looking now. I've been in and around adult literacy for over 20 years, working at Alpha Plus. Um, right now, my focus is on tech coaching with programs. I work closely with several programs to help them to integrate technology into their teaching and learning. I facilitate presentations and workshops. Um, just full disclosure here, I'm not a techie, but I'm a very enthusiastic user of technology. Um, and I really do believe that it has the potential to be um, a great tool for teaching and learning in adult literacy. So what are we going to do? Oops, a daisy, I'm sorry about that too enthusiastic with my clicking. So what are we going to do today? We're going to uh, take a look at uh, apps, applications for teaching and learning using mobile technology. We're going to take a look at what is an app, um, getting started with tablets and apps. And today I focused on apps that can be used for uh, iOS or Apple, iPad and iPhone and for Android um, tablets. Um, in most cases, you can when you when they're made for one platform, they can be used on another. They usually make them for both now. We're going to take a look at how apps can be used in the context of the OALCF competencies. Some general apps that can be used in the literacy classroom, finding apps, which can be a bit of a challenge, and evaluating apps, which is a critical piece. And then at the end, again, we will um, give you the link to the list of apps, documents, and information, and also to our feedback survey. And I ask you to fill that out. It really helps us to um, refine and improve our um, webinars. So what is an app? Well, it's just simply a piece, a type of software. It's, it just allows uh, you to do one specific thing. And we're very familiar with desktop top apps like Microsoft Word that we use for word processing, Google Chrome that we use as our search engine, Firefox, another browser, and then lots of mobile apps. And I just quickly put in three here, Yelp, which we know about, which helps you to find you know, restaurants and so on in your neighborhood or wherever you happen to be, Facebook, um, and Snapchat. But there are literally millions of mobile apps. Um, and we're not going to talk about millions today, but we are going to talk about a couple of dozen. It's always a question that we get about whether or not um, I should buy an, an Apple or an iOS tablet, like an iPad, or an Android tablet, like you see Samsung Galaxy is one that's often in use. I did a workshop a couple of years ago on um, tablets uh, in adult uh, literacy. And at that time, Apple was far outstripping um, Androids in terms of the number of apps. That has all changed now. And in this slide, I just have two columns. One is, you know, the iPads and the iPhones. Yes, they're easy to use. So are Android tablets and phones. iPad, there are more than a million apps for iPads. There are now more than a million apps for Androids. And as I said earlier, developers often develop for both platforms. The iPad is costly. Android tablets can be somewhat less costly iPads are proprietorial, that is to say you have to have an Apple device in order to um, take advantage of those apps. With Android you can use a range of, of devices, so sometimes that's an advantage. Some people are just Apple babies and some people are not. 
If you want to know more, if you have iPads or you're thinking about getting iPads in your program, this is a very good source of information about them, how to use them, um, how to set them up. And the same for Android. And this, these are both from um, GCF Learning. I'm going to just go to this site, so bear with me for a moment. Is it going to take me there? Yes, it is. And you can see that this is an excellent source of basic information. I would even encourage you to go there before you purchase Androids if you're planning to do so for your program or for yourself. Um, these are very, very clear, well-presented, comprehensive modules um, that you can use for your own purposes, you can use them with your students, um, and they help you to um, work effectively with your tablet. There's a similar one here for um, iPads, it's just as good, um, just as clear. So just let me get out of there now and go back to our presentation. Come on. It's not cooperating, of course. Wouldn't you know it? Oh, there we go. Okay. So that when you're making the decision about which kind of tablet to buy for your program, or if you already have tablets and you're wondering how to get started and you, how to use them effectively, I think these this is the best place to go to get started. Very simple, very straightforward, and designed for adult literacy instructors and students. Um, a couple of years ago, too, I worked on putting together, um, or think, trying to think about how apps for mobile devices could be used within the context of the OALCF competencies. Because one of the challenges that we have is that there are actually very few apps that you can say were designed specifically for adult literacy uh, learners or instructors. So I guess I should tell you that I'm essentially making a pitch that we need to think quite broadly when we're looking for apps to use on these devices. We need to look at apps that um, focus on everyday life, on finding information, and we need to think how we can build lessons and learning activities in the specific competencies using some of these apps. And one of the things I did was I just took the find and use uh, information competency and tried to look for apps that could help to support the development of learning activities in, the, in that competency. So you'll see here in find and use, I've gone quite broad. There's Kobo, which is an e-reader. You just get the e-reading app and you can borrow books from your local library, e-books, and, and use them to, to read on your device. Uh, dictionary app, which is, you know, very straightforward. Something like the Canadian Red Cross, I thought was a useful one because it's an app with all kinds of first aid and basic health information, and I thought, well, that could be a very useful um, basis. For, um, for a lesson or a learning activity. The same with the CBC News app, where you can get audio, video, and text. An excellent one that I, I was taken with is the Canada Food Guide app. It's called My Food Guide. And it really, um, again, provides the basis for a really you know, interesting set of learning activities. Google Maps, of course, um, which I think a lot of us use when we need to find our way around. And then another one that I thought was a bit intriguing, which is the Ontario G1 practice test. If you have students in your program who are trying to get ready for their G1 uh, test, this is an excellent app that's designed specifically for our driving test here in Ontario. And then there's the Canada Post app, which I love because you can track packages, you can find postal codes, um, and I think, again, it is a rich source for developing learning activities. Another one is Musella. Musella is only available, unfortunately, for iOS or Apple devices. It's not available yet for Android. It's an online newsletter. Um, and you can read the articles, which are right up to date, today's news, 
at five reading levels, and there's a quiz with each article. So this is a very good um, little learning tool um, and a good sort of conversation starter in your class. So that's really just a tiny little sliver of the kinds of apps that you could use within the context of find and use information. Now, does anybody have any questions about this? And, and I can try to answer them while I see a question in the question box. Got to get in there and see what's the, what the question is. No, it was a chat for Matthias. There are no questions. Okay, so we'll go on to the uh, competency. Come on which is communicate ideas and information. Again, I went, I looked for apps that could support learning within that competency. The first one is Speak It. Speak It is, um, you can get your computer, your tablet, to read a website to you with this app, and it's excellent. Dragon Dictation, which I think a lot of people already use, but there's a Dragon Dictation app. WhatsApp is a free communications app. And I know that a lot of people use it. I don't use it myself, but I know that a lot of people use it for texting. And I would suggest that using an app like that within the communicated ideas and information competency is a very interesting way um, to work with students. Students may already be using that app or a similar app on their phones. And so I think you can do a lot of learning in there. And then there's the um, you know very straightforward skill builder spelling. This is a spelling app, allows students to create or access word lists, practice spelling. So again, the, the idea is not so much that, you know, I found apps that said, okay, this works with, within the communicate ideas and information OALCF competency. It, that's not how it really works or how I found it to work. What I did was look at the competency, look at the kind of learning that has to go on within that competency and try to find apps that would support the development of learning activities um, within that competency. The same with understand and use numbers. One thing I have noted as I've been searching for apps over the, over the last couple of years, you can find a lot of math apps. There's a lot of math apps. A lot of them are designed for children because a lot of the educational apps you will notice, both for iOS and for Android, are focused in the K-12 sector. They're not really focused on adults. So when, when we come to the evaluation piece, we can, we can talk some more about that. But a lot of the apps are really, you know, they may have great content, but since they're designed for children, they're not always going to be very um, attractive to adult students. So in the understand and use numbers competency, I came across some um, that I think would work very well with students. And are not childish. The first is Big Calculator, which I love. It's just a straightforward calculator, but it's sort of a large size. That's, pardon me, that's available only for iOS. But there's an equivalent, Calculator Plus Free, that's available for Android. Then there's a flashcard app, which is very, very good. And again, you can, um, you know, play around with it. Um, you can add to it. Students can use it on their own. You could use it in a class. And the same with Fraction Calculator Plus. Then there's Math Academy, which is just the basic operations, lots of opportunity to practice. And the, um, the very well-known Khan Academy has an app. It's a very robust app. You have to go in there and search around for the appropriate areas. But again, thinking in a broader way about what how, how to create learning activities within this competency using your tablets and your apps. These are just some that I came up with. This list could be endless. So then I sort of went away and had to think about, okay, let's just unhook ourselves for a moment from specific competencies and look at some apps that would encourage writing, or uh, literacy activities and some numeracy. 
And again, it's a question of thinking quite broadly because you're not going to find apps that say this is for adult literacy. But there's a couple here that I, there are four here, there are many, many, many more. These are my choices based on thinking about, well, so if somebody wanted to read, to write, what if somebody wanted to create an ebook? What if you wanted to do some digital journaling? Um, so we looked at, I looked at for some of those apps. So I'm just going to take a look at the first one, what app? So just bear with me while we go there. It's in Google Play, it's Android and, but it's also available for iOS. And you'll see when you go into uh, Google Play, you get a pretty good description of the app. Tells you exactly what it is, how it works. Free stories and books written by published and aspiring authors, you can also publish in it. You can search for stories and follow stories as they get written. I'm just going to go to the read more. Um, and it gives you the features. And this is pretty much the same way it works in the uh, App Store in Apple. Um, you know, they're selling it to you in a certain sense, but they're also giving you a pretty good description before you download the app. At least that's the idea. Um, I just want to go back here. You'll see a couple of things I wanted to point out. You just install it here on your device. I can't install it because I'm not on a mobile device. A couple of things I want to point out to you. It says it's for teens, but actually you can use this with adults. The other thing you need to always look for is offers in-app purchases. A lot of apps are free, but there's an in-app purchase option. If you want to buy extra features, extra functions. So it's, it's good to when you're evaluating apps to take note of that and uh, because you really don't want to end up, uh, you know, um, whoops, where am I going? Um, you don't want to end up recommending apps to students and then find that they have to buy extra functions and features. So that in-app purchase um, is a bit of a red flag just to be aware of it. The other one I want to go and uh, take a look at is called Seesaw. It's a free digital journal. It's a digital portfolio, they say, that empowers students to independently document and share with their learning in school. They'll usually give you screenshots of the apps when you're, when, when you're making a, um, a decision. And uh, they'll give you customer reviews. Um, I don't know how much you trust customer reviews, but they're there. You get a pretty straightforward, simple description, but then if you go to more, you get the features. So in this one, for example, they, students can upload photos, videos, drawings. Um, you can browse work from the entire class or a single student. So you could use this with your entire group. You, now, they, you'll see here it says teachers can flag items in the digital portfolio for follow-up or to review. You see, it's really designed for um, K-12, but you can um, use it with adults. It, it's not childish. So again, it's just an example of an app that you could use to support learning activities when students are working on writing skills or communication skills. Um, I want to go on to the next list now. Even more apps, I've called this one, because there are literally millions. But again, I want to focus on a couple. This one I chose, the Learn to Read, Write, and Spell, because it, in investigating it, hang on a second, here it comes. It's designed for all ages. Um, again, as an instructor, you're going to have to make that evaluation as to whether or not it's useful for your students. It does not look very childish to me, but you're the instructor. You're going to make the decision based, as you would about any learning resource, based on the needs of your students. The other thing I should point out is that the price of an app is usually here over on the left-hand side free, or sometimes they can cost anything from $1.99 to 
I tried to focus today on app, on free apps or very low cost apps because you don't want to invest a lot of money um, unless you know the app is really, really good. So again, the description is pretty thorough. Um, they say it's made for all ages, non-readers, reading below their expected level, whatever that means. Um, the very beginning of the app is very basic. It assumes that students don't, don't know the letters of the alphabet, and then it goes on to uh, work its way through various skill levels. For example, blending letters, reading, writing, spelling, dictionary. So this, this one, I think, might be useful um, within, a, within the context of adult literacy. But again, each individual instructor is going to make that decision based on the needs of um, her, her students. Hi, Maria. We have a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. Yes. I'm um, just going to go back to the presentation. Sure. Is that okay? Yes. Before they uh, mount up, there's a few of them. Uh, Kathy is asking if Khan Academy is available. Uh, that Can, well, she's saying that Khan Academy is available online. Are all of the apps that you're showing available online? Do, does she mean like as Chrome apps or Google apps? Uh, yeah, maybe you can. Maybe you can. Uh, it's not, it's, it, in some cases, yes. A large app like, like Khan Academy would be, but some of the smaller, like single function apps, probably would not be available um, as Google Apps. But the apps that I'm talking about today, generally speaking, um, would be available for um, mobile devices like tablets and phones. Okay, thanks. And Jim is asking, can you download the apps on a PC desktop. Um, I suggested to him um, in a chat privately that probably through the through the Chrome browser and the Google Play Store you you might be able to. Yeah, you have to have an account and then you can. But um, uh, I haven't actually done that. But I, I, when I've been playing around in Google Play, I see that I could do that. Thanks, Maria. Any other questions? No, that's it. OK, thanks. So we've looked at learn to read, write, and spell. And I mean, in, a, in an ideal world, we would find a whole collection of apps like that that are designed for uh, literacy and literacy learning. But there aren't. So we have to, again, I'm sorry to be a bit of a broken record on this, but we really need to think very broadly when we look at apps about how, we, how they could be used um, uh, in the literacy classroom. So I wanted to take a, a look at another one called Bluster. Um, it's a word matching game. Um, it says it's for school age children, but, but really, it whoops, a daisy. It's, um, it can be used in, with adult students as well. I didn't find it um, to be too childish. Um, and it ha it's, it's a game. It has 800 words. You choose a skill you want to practice, and then you try to make matches of three. Um, again, it has an in-app purchase. Uh, function. So if you want to get additional vocabulary that is more than the 800 words, you're going to have to pay. And I just want to show you how much you could end up spending. So you have to decide. I mean, it's not outrageous, but if you want extra words, you see they come in at around about a um, dollar thirty-nine per per edition. Um, this is a screenshot. So before you download an app in either um, oops, the App Store for Apple or in Google Play, you do get a fairly good amount of information that would help you to make a decision. If the app is free, of course, you can just download it and play with it and see if it works for you. But you do get a fairly reasonable amount of um, information to help you make an informed decision. So that's Bluster, and there are literally thousands, 
and thousands of apps available both for Android and for uh, iOS with similar um, features and functions to this. Lots of gamified uh, learning in apps for the K-12 sector, many of which with, can be used with adults, some of which are not appropriate at all. And again, as an instructor, you're going to make that decision. But if you decide that this is the kind of thing you'd like to work with your students, see how they like it, see how, it, how effective it is, this is a pretty good one to start with. And I have way too many windows open, so I think I better start closing windows. This is one of my major faults. Have 45 windows open and then get totally lost, and you can't do that in the middle of a webinar. Okay, I'm just going to go back to the presentation. Maybe. Yes, here we are. You can see there's another list of apps here. And again, all of these are in that link that um, Matthias has put in the chat, and maybe Matthias is going to put it in again so um, you can grab it. There, there are some that I thought could be very um, interesting in an adult literacy classroom, like Penzo. It's a free diary, a free diary journal or notepad app, so you can write in it. Dictionary.com flashwords, again, it has words lists, it has quizzes. An interesting one that you can be used and, and, and has been used by some programs for their um, numeracy teaching is Shop Savvy, where you can compare um, prices for specific um, items and you can find sales in your local area. Again, there's you know some pretty good learning activities that can be developed out of that. The Transit app, here in Toronto, the, um, we have a transit app, so I can tell when my bus or subway is due, and I can also do some um, trip planning, and that's a pretty good app to use too as a basis for some uh, interesting learning activities. Uh, most cities will have a transit app uh, by this point that's connected to the, their uh, local transit uh, GPS, and of course there's Google Maps and Street View. Um, which, which is just, again, a very rich, um, you can develop a, a very rich set of learning activities using Google Maps. You can do navigation. You can, again, do transit schedules. You can take a look at Street View anywhere. That's always pretty exciting. I just want to go back briefly, if I can. Oops. Now I'm going forward. I should be going back. Um, to talk about some of the other apps that I didn't talk about before. Oops. What am I doing? Please forgive me. I am losing it. I have lost it. I'm going to try to be more sensible here. Oops. There we go. See this, I just wanted to, I missed, I skipped over these. Book Creator Free, you can create ebooks. So students are working on something together or individually, they can actually publish it online. Um, the other one that I wanted to point out to you was Remind, where you can send very quick announcements and messages to your class, to your colleagues. Students can send you messages, um, they can send messages to each other. So again, those have the potential to be very interesting in, um, in an adult literacy classroom. And I want you to take a look at some apps that are really more for instructors. Shobi is a really interesting one that a colleague turned me on to. And I want to go take a look at that because I think it could be quite useful. If it's a little complex to use, but I think it's worth checking out. Let's see if we can get in there. Take a look at Shobi. Come on, Shobi. Oops. Come on. Where's my hyperlink? There we go. Oops. It's not going to let me. All right. I'll have to go on the internet and take a look at it. Hang on. Let's go take a look at Shobi.
here it is, they call it the paperless classroom. Not entirely sure that's true, but um, you can use it to send assignments to students, to grade students, grade their work, and you can do it all on your mobile device. So let's read a little bit more about it. Here it is. You can collect, you can assign work, you can collect work, and you can review work. Um, you can have your students complete assignments with the built-in tools in Shogi. You can provide feedback. You can share work from other apps. You can uh, distribute instructions and materials to your class, or you can chat privately. You can record voice notes for verbal feedback. I mean, I can see language teachers using that. But again, I think it's one of those apps that, as an instructor, you might find very helpful as you're working with a group of students or with individual students. So I just wanted to bring that one to your attention. And again, there are many, many more apps like this, but this seems to get good reviews and to be in, in use. The other ones you probably know about, something like Pocket, where you can save uh, and recommend stories on the web. So if you're searching the web, you have the Pocket app, you can save um, web information or stories in there to share with your students. Dropbox, something we all use or many of us use, you can save and back up documents and photos and videos and all kinds of other files, and everything is safely backed up. And Evernote, where you can collect and um, annotate um, websites, and you can create searchable notes in notebooks, you can do checklists, you can photos, audio, video. We have done quite a lot of work at Alpha Plus on Evernote, and if you go into our webinars archive, You'll find a couple of um, you'll find at least one webinar, and I think there may be two, on uh, using Evernote. The list of links to apps and information that I'm going to give you today, we put it into a public Evernote notebook. So when you click on that, you'll actually be in Evernote, so you'll get a chance to explore and see if it's something that would be uh, helpful to you. Um, and again, there's an Evernote app, there's a Dropbox app, there's a Pocket app, both for Android and for iOS. So all of those can really be useful as an instructor to keep your um, materials, your documents, your students' work, etc., uh, in one easy-to-access place. And I just then wanted to show you one of my absolute favorite apps. Let's see if this is going to let me open it. Yes, it is. Called uh, Remember the Milk. I've given this to my husband as a gift, even though it was free. Um, it's just a great little app that's so easy. It's just create to-do lists, create lists, create your shopping list. Super easy to use. Um, you get reminders. Uh, you can get reminders. You can set it up to get your reminders via email, by text, or in Twitter. You can share your lists and give tasks to others. So again, it's a very good sort of organizing tool, very easy to use, and sort of a fun way to remember things and not forget the important things that you have to do every day. It's available for iOS and for Android. You could use it within your class. You could have your students use it. Um, and it's super simple, and it works really, really well. And you'll see here. When I open up the description, it's telling me I don't have any devices because I haven't I haven't got an Android device. I, I'm not looking at it on an Android. I'm not going to install it on my on my laptop. So that's remember the milk. I always love the title of that one. Whoops. I don't mind the little icon either. So. As I was putting this together, I read this really good piece on teachthought.com. And again, that link is going to be in the list of links, called 25 Tips for Teaching with Apps. So I tried to uh, pick out a few that we could think about as we're, um, 
um, going through this webinar. The first is when you're looking at apps, it's helpful to think about how you can design learning experiences. That is, what is it that you're trying to accomplish with your students and what can the app contribute to that? Or what is the app sparking that you could do in your classroom? It's not a straightforward, oh, this app is just going to, I'm just going to bring it in, I'm going to introduce it to the students, and everything's just going to go fine. Now, you need to do a little bit of a, a lesson planning piece around it um, so that you get, you can A, see if it's of any use to you, and B, you can get the most out of it. Finding apps, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, there are lots of them, but not always that easy to find them. So. They're not going to just pop into your inbox. So you need to use app search engines, which are a variable quality, but we'll get to that later. But use app search engines to find apps. You also need to organize what you find. So it's good to set up some way to curate the apps that you are thinking about using, that you are using, um, and about the kinds of activities that you're looking for in an app so that you can quickly go back, find out what you need, and, and use it. A critical thing is not everything that looks great is going to have a place in your classroom, and you as the instructor are the final decision maker about that. And sometimes you get lots of hype about an app, and you think you ought to be using it, and then you discover that's no good, it's never going to work for me, I don't like it, or it's not useful for me or my students. And then I guess even more critical is be patient. It does not happen like very quickly. You get better at discovering apps, you get better at using apps, you get better at evaluating apps, the more you um, time you spend on it. Also, as you start working with students with mobile devices using apps, patience is probably your best friend because things do go wrong. They don't crash that much, but people get lost. You know, unless you have really dug into the app and understood what is happening in there in terms of the learning, it, it can get a bit chaotic. So like any learning uh, resource, you need to be patient as you evaluate it and as you introduce it to your students. This, oh, you know all of this already. I know you do. But I thought this 25 tips for teaching with apps was pretty good. And so I've included it, as I say, in that list of resources um, that Matthias has shared the link for. Matthias, am I seeing um, questions in my question box that I'm ignoring? Uh, no, no questions at this okay. point. Thanks for checking. All right. So now uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about finding apps, which, you know, and you can see from this great long list of possible uh, places um, that it can be a bit of a challenge. The place, the two places that you'll go to most likely are the three places, sorry, are the App Store, that's for Apple, for iPad, for iPhone. The Apple Education Collection, it's a pretty well curated and organized collection, but again, the focus is on um, K-12 to or on more general adult learning, not really on adult literacy, so you have to dive in there and look around very carefully. The other place you'll go for Android apps is Google Play. Again, pretty well curated, pretty well organized, but you're not going to find this is, you know, a section that says this is for adult literacy. So again, you have to um, poke around in there quite a bit, but you will find an excellent, uh, like, range. And in both, as I said earlier, in both the um, app for Apple and for Android, there are well over a million apps for each. So I think you can find some. The one that I would recommend or, you know, tell you it's worth your while going to is EdShelf. It's really designed. Oops, a day easy. It's really designed as a, a, a search engine for teachers, so that you can um, um, filter. You can create. Um, you know, you can search by topic. You can search by year. You can search by uh, level. I'm just going to go in there and take a quick look at EdShelf with you. Um, so this is the one that I would, I wouldn't, I would say it's probably the one I would check first. Again, you can see that it, generally speaking, tends to focus on 
children, but within that you are going to find um, some excellent learning apps. So um, again, this, this is in the list that we're going to share with you. But this is this is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to just try to um, look at what's in there. Will it work for me? Will it work for my students? You can see that you can create a shelf in here, and you can share it. So sometimes people do this with very high quality. and tell you how to use the particular app, the age of learner that it will work with, that, you know, which, which platforms it runs on. Um, so again, this is a pretty good place to start. You might have to spend some time in there to get comfortable in the environment to figure out, you know, how to search it. But because you can filter so finely, I think it's a very useful place to start. So that's Edge Shelf. And then you can also, as I say, you can get access to other people's shelves and you can create your own. So I think this is a, a very useful one and one that uh, for, for, for professional educators is a good place to start. So that's Ed Shelf. Then there are all these other ones over on this side, which are, you know, app search engines, some better indexed than others. And, and again, they're worth looking at um, and worth spending time on. But the focus in a lot of them is on apps for entertainment, I find, rather than apps for learning. So um, although they're worth looking at, I would tend to focus more on Edge Shelf, Google Play, and the Apple Education Collection. But by all means, have a look at the others because you may find some pretty interesting apps in there that would work with you and your students. One place to go, for example, is the Best App Awards. They do a list of the they award um, in various categories each year. And it's a good place to know because you might find the perfect app in there. The other interesting thing is this, apps for finding apps. You can actually get apps that will help you to find apps. So I just thought we'd take a look at that. This is from a great site called Mashable, where all things technology related show up. Okay, come on. So it says it would take a full-time job to customize the best apps to suit our needs. And they're like, you can use, so, you hear about them. Like, I don't know where Angry Birds came from, but suddenly every kid knew what Angry Birds were. I don't know. It just goes around the schoolyard, I guess. But there are apps that can help you to find apps. So they've laid out 10 of them, 10 apps for finding apps, things like app grooves. So again, this, this link is in that list. So you could literally download an app that will help you to find apps. So I thought that was a kind of a fun um, way to do it. Um, and again, you can get to this, this piece here from Mashable in the list that, uh, that we're going to share with you, that we have shared with you, I hope, and that we're going to share with you at the end. Now I think we're coming to sort of the meat of it. How do you figure out if apps are any good for you uh, in your classroom for your students? Um, I put together a short list here of uh, evaluation questions, of checklists and rubrics that you can use. But you're probably going to end up developing your own, but, I, but maybe these are going to be useful to you in getting that uh, process started. So I just think I'll open the first one. This is put together by uh, Apple. I would like to open this file. Thank you very much. If you're going to let me. Um, this is put together by Apple, and um, it really is just a set of questions to ask yourself. I would like to open this up, but it won't let me. Okay, I'll have to go in and do it myself. Um, questions that you would ask when you're evaluating any reading or learning resource. You're going to want to know, is this going to work with my students? What's, uh, what's uh, 
what's being taught here, what's being learned here, how is this going to work in a group, how is this going to work um, with my students, how is it going to work with an individual student. So these questions are just designed to spark your thinking about how you would evaluate an app and how you would perhaps introduce an app. You see these, what is it appropriate for, etc. Does it allow you to do something you were unable to do in the past? Can student data be sent to the teacher? You know, those kinds of questions that maybe are used to you. How much instruction will be needed to use the app? So I think, whoops, a daisy. Um, so I think these kinds of questions can help spark your questions because a critical part of using apps in, in the literacy classroom is evaluating them based on what you know your students need and what you need for your students. So take a look at these links, they will be in the list, and use them to support your own, developing your own checklists or rubrics as you're looking at apps. Don't have to be complicated, some of these are quite complex because somebody may be choosing apps for a school board or for a large institution. If you're working in a small program, you're going to pick what are the key things for me? But I would really encourage you to have a rubric or to have a checklist that you can quickly go through when you're looking at an app, just to save yourself time and so you end up um, getting the apps that are most useful to you. Now, oops, Daisy. Apps are great. Mobile devices are great. More and more people are using them. They're coming into literacy programs more and more often. Students are coming into the classroom with their own mobile devices. It would be great if we could capitalize on that, help students to learn anywhere using apps on their phones or their devices. That's where we're headed. But for the moment, we still are dealing with some pretty fundamental issues. For example, as I've said before, there aren't many apps designed for adult literacy learning. More are coming online, but not quickly, and we can't really depend on there ever being like a huge collection of them. So we need to think more broadly about how we are going to use apps to support adult literacy learning and teaching. Sometimes we have classroom connectivity issues. You, you know, you need to have Wi-Fi to use those devices in your classroom. And that's often an issue. Scarcity of time. It takes time to find apps and to evaluate apps. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. It's not an instant process. Just like any learning resource, you have to put time into figuring out how it works, why it works, if it works for you. And of course, as usual, within the literacy field, we don't have a lot of professional development um, to help us think through the potential of mobile technology. So what do we do about some of these issues? This is just my thinking at the moment. Try to look for apps in the broadest sense, apps that support learning and communications and collaboration, rather than looking for specific literacy apps. You will find a lot that deal with basic literacy skills, but if you want to take advantage of mobile technology, we need to look a little broader, using real world apps. Just ask your students which apps they may be using and why, or their kids are using and why. It's a good way to learn about um, how people are using mobile technology. A critical thing, and I know that it takes time as well, but what we really need to do is share our own questions and our own learning about apps and mobile technology. When we find great apps, find a way to share them. Maybe that's EdShelf, maybe that's where we start. Um, maybe we start a Facebook group where we share uh, information and questions about apps. Um, in the uh, list of resources, I put in this um, uh, article which says, Adult Education Finally Hit to the Game, which is a great title. And in there, um, uh, a researcher is discussing what, how the use of mobile technology and apps is beginning to make inroads in adult education 
There's much more to be done, but it really is supporting the idea that this is how we are going to consume information, how we're going to communicate and collaborate. So there are beginning to be more applications that are suitable for adults, that are interesting to adults, and that support adult learning. So my hope is that that's going to happen more and more, and that as we learn more about how mobile technology and apps work in terms of supporting adult literacy teaching and learning, that we'll find more effective ways of sharing what we're learning and sharing our questions and supporting each other. So that's pretty much my presentation. This is the link to the resources. In there I put every app we've talked about and several, um, I call them readings, just very short articles that may be helpful to you, as well as all the evaluation rubrics and the um, um, information about the apps themselves. So you can grab this. Matthias has put it in the chat. You can grab it from the chat. It will be in the recorded uh, webinar. So go in there and have a look at the apps and see what you think. See if they work for you. Um, and look at the evaluation uh, materials to um, develop your own so that when you find apps or somebody recommends an app to you, you can very quickly evaluate it based on your own needs and the needs of your students. And then you can think about how it can be incorporated into your classroom, into your teaching. Do I have a question, Matthias? No questions? Uh, no, not at the moment. Um, so if okay, you does anybody have to your hand if you're like Sorry? I'm sorry, Matthias, I can't hear you. Sorry, no questions right now. Okay. So if anybody has questions, please pop them in the uh, chat box. Um, we'd really appreciate it if you would go to this link and fill out the survey to help us understand um, what you think about the webinars, how you can improve them, how they can be refined, etc. We have webinars planned for the rest of the year. I think we're going to take a little break in July and August. They'll start again in September. You can look at the list at this link, webinars.alphaplus.ca. Um, we hope you'll attend as many as possible. All of our webinars are recorded, and you can go into our archived webinars section and listen to all of them going back um, a few years. So I'm just going to leave it open as you uh, fill out your survey. And again, if you have any questions or comments, very happy to, um, to talk to you for the, for the uh, few minutes left in our hour. <laughs>